Hi, and welcome to another episode of Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom. Today, I talked to a comic book artist that I met at MightyCon. A few, I, I met a lot of people from MightyCon. Actually, it was a great, there was a whole row of people that I wanted to meet. So this worked out fantastic because this is what the show's about, meeting people. So he did artwork that stood out to me because he was printing it on demand there. He had a large printer and the full color printer and was doing poster size art that was coming out like as he was talking to me, like artwork he did, he was hanging it all up and he was doing comic book hero art. He was, he was drawing pictures of famous characters from uh, the comics and movies and animation and doing things like that. And he kind of tells me that he came about this in a haphazard kind of way in while he was already trying to promote a comic book that he did and then pivoted, literally pivoted while he was at a Comic-Con, one of his first ones. He was there to promote a comic book and just saw what was happening and switched his entire career around this. And he's been doing it ever since. And he travels the circuit. He goes and does stuff like this all the time. He's designed stuff for toy makers. Uh, uh, it was a great conversation. We, we go off on a few tangents because we seem to have a couple of the same interests. So I was able to keep my own in a lot of the stuff we talked about, but we bring it back and we talk about how he uh, actually made the transition to going and doing art full time, like saying, I'm going to leave my factory job and do this, which is easy to say, but how do you do it? So we talk about things like that, fun conversation. So here is my interview starting right now. My name is Terry Huddleston, and what I do is I draw men in tights for a living. Um, <laughs> I, I, I do uh, pinup art. Um, I got uh, my style in particular is um, easy to recognize because I got a couple of weird influences. One not so weird is the box art for toys. As a kid, I grew up in a little rinky dink small town that didn't have access to a lot of stuff. Yeah. So I didn't know comic books existed. I know this is weird, but true. But huh. I, I, I I watched Superman on movies, TV, and Wonder Woman. That's how I knew that those characters existed. And I would go get the toys. <clears throat> and I love the art on the toys, mm. which happens to be uh, Jose Garcia Lopez, mm. a, a, an unsung hero in the in the realm of um, of comic book art, if you ask me. Because if you had that Superman bed set, which we all did, mm -hmm. where he's flying like this. Yes, yep. Jose Garcia Lopez. It's like the <laughs> I didn't quintessential. Know that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. See, yeah. He, what's funny is he thinks old as hell, and he's still drawn for the DC style guy to this day. So all the oh. anytime you buy a Batman gift bag, that's well, it's two guys now. It's Mike McCone and Jose Garcia Lopez working together. Okay. But if you've wondered how that art stayed consistent over the course of your lifetime is because one guy one unsung hero has been but he, but he's been a big influence on me because his art uh translated very well it communicated the character in a way to where like the logos didn't get covered up like you could see the full costume and mm -hmm. if you were going to draw it for yourself you would you would look off of one of these guys drawings for, for dc anyway yeah marvel never really had a set um uh style guide art i don't even know yeah, they didn't uh, get into production or like doing yeah. things like that until they started no. making movies. Like they were the yeah. un they were they did not do stuff like that. Also, no. I was going to say the the artwork since you seem knowledgeable of it. The album artwork I had that I always copied, basically I would trace, is the old Superman Zoom record. You remember that one? It, mm -hmm. it, it, mm -hmm. Yeah, like I want. Yeah, that's okay. I was like, I see Lopez. That is I'll, okay. I'll, yeah. Yep, I bet you. I'm gonna I'm gonna pull it up on my phone. I know <laughs> I, I I can I can guess what image they use. Um, Probably, yeah. To do that because um, um, I still have that it, record. His Superman is so iconic. Yeah, but you like you just don't know the guy. But I like his art is impeccable. Yeah. Let's see. I'm gonna. Um, yeah, the uh, the album artwork that phone. I have, I can tell that like I can still see like I would put the piece of paper on top of the album and then trace it. So yep. there's like indentations all along the record. Like you can see just. <laughs> I don't know if you can see that. Was it this one? That's exactly the one. Yeah. How did I know? <laughs> That's Jose Garcia Lopez. <laughs> That's yep. funny. 
Yep. Nice. I like that you had it on your phone. Or did you Google that? I, did, I, just, I literally just looked up Jose Garcia Lopez Superman. And, it, and, and that's, that, what that, it that's how ubiquitous his art okay. is. Okay, so your point is made. That's valid. Yeah, yep, yep. this is another <laughs> one you've seen a thousand times. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Yep. That's like and, something and they would put on like wallpaper. or like Exactly. Some, yep. Uh, he, I'm telling you, he was the guy that if you're a nerdy kid, you were surrounded <laughs> by his art. If you like DC, the yeah. Super Friend stuff. Uh, Alex Toth is another one. That, oh, um, yeah. Yeah, There's Alex Toth, influence. I know. Yeah, everybody knows Alex Toth, man. That's that's super friends and just had a barbaric cartoons. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, anyway, yeah, I, I think I went off on a tangent there. But that's why then my second influence was uh Atlases. I had a fascination with the way maps look. And as a as a little kid, checking out the Atlas felt amazing because it was this big giant book. Oh, okay. Like it, it was an oversized book that I would have to haul home like a grimoire or something. Right. And uh, I open it up and I'm looking at Denmark, Sweden, these random foreign lands and all these roads are going and 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 that, that type of intricate line work uh, stuck with me all these years. Yeah. As far have as you been, what, I, what I like to see. Well, did you actually travel to any of those places? Did it inspire you to travel? I, you know, I did do a, a scooter travel. I was in the military for a little bit, and oh. with with them, I we went. I went to England. That was about as close as I got to going to those places. But um, yeah, um, and hell, if you go to New England, you you've been to Europe. <laughs> 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 like if, or actually, I think people uh, might dispute that, but okay. You, I, I, you go to New England and like just pretty much the old country of yeah. America, like it's you're like, oh god, this smells, this smells bad. <laughs> um, but uh, and it's just because everything's right on top of each other. Like, yeah, if you live in a more modern city, mm-hmm. um, matter of fact, I just came back from Seattle. Like, you can't get any more modern than that. Like, yeah. They're using rainwater to flush the toilet. So I'm like, you know what? Okay. You guys have galaxy brains over here. And a lot of rain, of course. But, yeah. Um, got to do something uh, with it. You got to do something with it. I was like, that's genius. That's yeah. like, I'm just going to do an extra flush just to, you know. Uh, <laughs> do your part. Use the rainwater. But um, so, yeah, I, I've, but I've traveled all over our country and I've been to uh, Canada a bunch of times. Um, wow. uh, and is that but, you traveled uh, specifically because of the comic circuit? Yeah, exactly. Like okay. it, it's um, I was funny. So it's funny you asked me if I travel. So I never, I, I, I remember what, being a kid watching these old black and white uh, films, and the dad would be like a traveling salesman, and he would come home, and mm-hmm. the daughter would be like, "What'd you get me, dad?" And I remember thinking like, "I'd never want to be that guy," <laughs> and now I'm that guy. <laughs> like, yeah, but I, I, I distinctly discriminated like I don't want to be a traveling salesman selling vacuum cleaners and trinkets. <laughs> And, you know, I, it, it dawned on me, like, you're not selling trinkets, but right. you're a traveling salesman. Yeah, so. yeah, kind of. And also when it's, what did you get me? Yours, your gifts yeah. are probably a lot cooler. They're not just well, like, my, a, my here's daughter, a magnet yeah. from the bus station. Exactly. <laughs> my daughter asking me that, my youngest one, I got four kids, is made, what made it click. Like, oh my God, I've become the cliche that I didn't want to become. Yeah. She was like, you find anything cool for me? And I'm like, that's a new variation of what'd you get me, dad? You know, so... Eh, you know, and, and look, I'm, I got first world problems. I always say all right. the time when, when you, when you do what I do, you know, you don't have any real actual problems. Like there's nothing that's really affecting my life in a negative way. Cause I right. get to do the dumbest job in the world, which is once again, draw men in spandex. So right. come on, like, what do I really got to be like upset about? Like boohoo, I got to travel to, to get a bunch of money for selling men in tights, you know, not a big deal. Um, I just like to, you know, I, I got to make something up. Like my life's so hard. You don't know the struggle of what it's like to, to draw things. <laughs> well, it had to be, it had to be first starting out. I mean, you, you clearly went into this, like uh, when you started, how did you end up starting out to uh, even just start drawing them and uh, trying to sell it? Well, so I, I think I came in a little bit differently than uh, most people that are like industry people. And uh, I, like I said before, I had a lot of bunch of, different jobs that I did. So I kind of came in as a very blue collar workman mindset. Mm-hmm. And I, I, from the beginning, I, I knew because I, I was a big Jack Kirby fan that I never really wanted to work in the comic book industry. Uh, not like, not for like Marvel or DC. Mm-hmm. So I never pursued it. Not once. Uh, just because it, the, those stories, another cliche, they always ended bad. Like even if you made it big, uh, more often than not, they would take your IPs and, and I'm not, I'm not trying to 
talk shit against the big companies. It's right. just no, there's no reason Jack Kirby should have died penniless. I'm just saying. Yeah, it, it's 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 the reason crazy. that Image became a you know a company. Exactly. It's the reason there's there's yeah many stories definitely. Dude, what's and funny? Search yeah, YouTube image and you can find are, lots of biographies on stuff yeah. that where this happened to people. Yeah. Yep. They they start. I mean, Image is like what's funny is everybody makes fun of millennials, but they were. I know this is inaccurate, but they were the millennials of their day. Yeah. That was like we're not going to stand for this oppressive work environment. Yeah, and the old guard was like, "Take it back in my day. I would draw eight pages for nothing, <laughs> you know." And they were like, "No, nope, we're gonna start our own thing." So obviously, we're all the same. We're all in that same age group as the image guy, so we're not millennials. But mm-hmm. that, that I, I like to push back against the millennial mindset uh, that people will feel like it's this new thing. Like, no, the youth always rebel against the any oppression that the old guard has been gotten comfortable with. Mm-hmm. I mean, it happened in the '60s. It happened, you know, happened in the twenties. It happens all the time. So yeah. uh, that was just another iteration of that. It even happened to the people that did create Marvel, like with uh, uh, Stan Lee and all them. And yeah, they did yeah. start out that way. But again, like you said, it always ends poorly. So yeah, well, yeah. I mean, well, then not so Stan. Stan is a is Stan and um, Jack Kirby is a is a nice dichotomy of like I I like to study the black box of both of those men's lives because. They, they're like Stan Lee obviously was the, the P.T. Barnum of comics. Yeah. Um, but he wasn't like the actual lion tamer, right? No. Like he he just was the guy that had the big tent. I mean, obviously, look, he wrote a bunch of stuff. Don't get me wrong. But it was I feel the same way about George Lucas, where if people knew that Ralph Mc, who Ralph McQuarrie was, uh, he should be a household name. But he's not like mm-hmm. only like, you know, high end nerd people know who Ralph McQuarrie is. Everybody else like. Who's that? Well, for people who don't know, that's the guy that designed all the shit you like about Star Wars, <laughs> not George Lucas. And uh, I mean, there was other artists too. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But for the most part, the, your Boba Fett, your Vader's, all that, that's not George Lucas, right. <laughs> you know, but it's so it's just weird. Uh, I, anyway, I, I went in, I went in with all this baggage mm-hmm. of knowing I didn't want to be exploited um, by uh, a mega industry. But, and, um, the very first show I did was I had an indie book called The What about this kind of like if you take Plastic Man and, you know, classic kind of Hanna-Barbera and Alex Toth type sensibilities of this character that could shapeshift pretty much. He could stretch, okay. he can grow. I mean, he was he was pretty much the super scroll, but in a more comedic Saturday morning cartoon kind of vibe. And, when um, was this? This was 2007, I think. Okay. Uh, and uh, it, it was like five kids, and me and a buddy of mine, Alan Shell, worked on this together. Uh, he he created like the bulk of the story, and I I created the look of of the book, and uh, so we kind of co-created. And uh, they, it went nowhere. That book sold miserably. I think I sold five copies. You self-publish it? So we, I published it. At, I self self-published it. I published it at FedEx Kinkos. Nice. Uh, <laughs> I printed them out and stapled the pages and. Wow. You know, so that, this, this was like back when it was still rough and tumble. Uh, I, I think they they did have um, I forgot what they called Kablam back then, but yeah. I couldn't I couldn't afford that kind of a print run back in, back then. Yeah. Um, and I'm I'm set up at the show, trying to move my book. It's got 20 pages of some of the best art I had could muster at the time, and I, I still look at that book; it still holds up. Nobody wanted it, but there's a guy down the way from me selling, you know, decent. It's not great art. But man, he sure does have a line in front of his table and he's just selling pinups. Okay. And over in. And I'm like, you know what? Uh, I'm going to push this book aside. I put a sign out that said, I'll draw uh, anything you want within reason. You're talking about at a Comic Con, you're saying? At a Comic Con, yep. Okay. This is a Comic Con. This is the same Comic Con I, I premiered that book in. So this, this is Saturday out of a, I think, a four day Wizard World show. Uh, back when Wizard World was like the big the big dog in the Midwest. Yeah. And uh, I put that sign out. And uh, at the time, I was still working a nine to five. And uh, over the course of a weekend, I think I made like six hundred and sixty something dollars. OK. Which was about what I made at my job in two weeks working at a job I didn't even like. So like this, this, this probably serotonin bomb and dopamine bomb, like get me at the same time. I'm like, <laughs> wait a minute, I could actually make money doing what I like to do. Yeah. You know, it, it almost felt like theft in a way because it just was too good to be true like there's no way i can make money drawing superheroes because it's, it's exactly what i want to do but 
I've been taught that you have to you have to do what you don't want to do to make money. Okay. Uh, uh, Americans, we have a suffer for your money mentality. Yeah. Um. So once I kind of settled into that, um, and I had to make a choice. It's one of the 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 few tempo choices of my life. One was getting married to my wife. Uh, that was I mean, these are just spontaneous. Like, hey, babe, we're just what we're doing. You 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 in or out? And we we have been dating for a long time, so it was like we just met. Okay. Um, that was amazing choice. And then I made the choice to choose art or nine to five. And it was like going to be a binary. If I chose nine to five, then I was going to progress in some kind of work hierarchy and become the best of that. Or I was going to focus on art a hundred percent of the time. And I chose art and it's, it's such an irresponsible choice in hindsight, but it, it led to me getting better faster because it's, I'm just devoting 16 hours a day to drawing. Now, not, yeah. I'm not working a nine to five. I'm not going on a plan. I'm just drawing all the time. And so I was able to basically go from being a, a, a mediocre artist to a decent artist in a relatively quick time. And then, you know, you go from decent to good. And then now I've entered from out of, you know, last five years from good to great. Okay. Uh, and I'm not saying that like, oh, I'm the I'm not saying I'm the best artist, but I, I, you got to know your value. You got to know where you stand in the, you know, the realm of uh, possibility when it comes to art skill. But you're a self-sustaining artist. And, and I guess yes. it's, it's easy for, I mean, anybody who draws could make the same decision, but how did you make it so that it worked? Like what, what was the progression going in? Like, that's the hard part. Like, and I, you know, it, it's it's very easy to go. Well, I want to draw and do that for a living. What was the what was the thing that kind of pushed you ahead? Well, I had a lot of um, I got I had a lot of negative traits and and positive traits, but a lot of negative traits that okay. I was able to synthesize into positive traits. I grew up as an only child for about twelve years, and then my my mom, you know, uh, had a little I had a little brother, but we were just so far apart. Like it just never we never quite gelled together. Okay. And so I, I kind of had this solitary mindset, no matter what. That's one. Two, you kind of develop a, a a clarity of purpose that people that didn't grow up alone don't have. Like I'm, I'm a committee of one. Mm -hmm. Like I don't really have that desire to impress or get people's approval. Okay. Um, it's 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 like I said. I'm not saying it's great, but it's 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 one of those things that has led to me uh, being able to uh, make unilateral decisions, like I said before, that benefit me quicker because I'm not waiting on a bunch of people to be comfortable with something that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And obviously that's led, that's been bad in some way, especially as a marriage, you got, you got to work by committee, but, yeah. um, and I've, I've learned, I've been trained over the years, but um, that being said, um, it, it like, if you, I knew it plus I knew I knew I I think the, the 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 advantage I had the positive trait I had is that I I already like I explained before about the roadmaps and 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 box art I already had a clear singing voice even if I was I was showing my kids who some of them weren't even born at the time I started this thing and uh mm -hmm. my oldest is I think he was like seven or eight now he's 20. But uh, I was showing them my earliest art, and they were just like, like, oh, ugh. I was like, yeah, it's bad, <laughs> I know. Um, but uh, it it's still consistent. Like I still have a consistent style from back then all the way to now. Like where it's and so it's it was kind of fun and cathartic to see that you know the embryonic uh, version of me versus where I am now. And mm -hmm. then you know hopefully I can look back now and go, oh, that's terrible compared to you know how many umpteen years, you know, into the future that I get. So uh, I think having a, a distinct uh, art style, which I, I, I dub the singing voice. If you have a singing voice that people recognize, um, it really helps you out. You know, once I last on the symmetry in 2010, uh, that was about two or three years into my career. Uh, that's really actually what's crazy. That's when I started getting the most gratification. And that's when also everything took off for me because I was able to uh, really build up a big supply of superhero characters in a, in a market that didn't have a lot of superhero artwork in it. Like you think it would, it's Comic-Con, but it doesn't. Mm -hmm. So 
even to this today, if you go looking for Martian Manhunter, good luck. Right. I'm literally probably your only place you're gonna find Martian Manhunter or Booster Gold, Blue Beetle. Like I love the old school superheroes. And yeah. so that combined with like I said, my distinct art style, I've I've dragged that for 14 years to, to every comic out I can. And I, I consider myself a, a old school ambassador to yesteryear because the, the movies and TV shows have taken over, which I'm super grateful for because without them, I wouldn't be able to have this industry in its current configuration. But at the same time, a lot of the old school sensibilities kind of would die off if I wasn't bringing them along. Like you just wouldn't see these characters anymore. Right. Like you wouldn't see Blue Beetle at a show. There's no reason. Yeah. He's not on any TV show, so nobody's going to draw him. Well, in the Comic Cons, we're talking about just so people who aren't familiar with it aren't confused. We're talking about like the the mini, like the Mighty Cons and all that. We're not talking about like yeah. the the San Francisco Comic Con with the movies and the stars and the Marvel and yeah. all that. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah, those those are tentpole shows. Those are like, you know, yeah. maybe two or three. Uh, though, though really, yeah, about two or three of those type of shows go off a year where right. everybody musters up. And even then, though, uh, because it's so industry centric, that's um, true. Actually, if, it's if you're, less a, if less. you're a comic book fan, it's hard to find comic book characters. Yeah, and that's a good um, point. I it's, mean, it's, it, it's, comic book characters in the sense of like walking around and seeing the artists and the creators. It's it's. I mean, they'll be like premiering the new X Men movie or something like that, but. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It becomes a, a tight biome that uh, you know. I grew up with the expansive uh, pantheon of Marvel and DC, and and yeah. So out of the two companies, I will admit I'm probably gonna get flamed here. I do like Marvel better. Uh, because, see, I'm a DC guy. <laughs> see, see, I knew it. I'm glad we got some conflict, folks. That's what makes for great entertainment. Yeah. Um, and and I don't got anything against DC as a whole, but the fact that we're on Ant Man three. It speaks for itself. Oh, yeah. Man no, DC, DC's worst uh, commodity is making movies. Like, they rarely yes. make a good movie. Like, yes. But I will tell you this. DC is far more superior in the animated realm. Is it, Oh, yeah, for sure. They, yeah. they own that. They own that. Yeah. They own that. But what's crazy, it's like the left hand isn't talking to the right hand. Oh, yeah. I saw, I see this Super Friends, uh, Super Pets oh, uh, yeah. commercial. And I'm like, why haven't you idiots put out a Pixar style 3D animated superhero movie? Yeah. Like I fell in love with that Superman rendition instantly. I was like, that is so cool <laughs> to see a stylized 3D animated Superman. Mm -hmm. But it's like, no, we're doing the pets. Like, ah, you're so close. Uh -huh. Just do the Justice League like that. You will make a like Disney would have did that. 10 times over like and so oh, because yeah. i thought i thought captain marvel shazam excuse me i'm i know it's not captain marvel anymore. Uh -huh. shazam would have been way cooler as a pixar style 3d animated feature, yeah yeah in yeah. my opinion because you could have had the whimsy and uh you know it also felt like um we're on a tangent now i oh, felt yeah. like i felt like jumanji the rock in jumanji was the best rendition of captain marvel shazam that i've ever seen and what I mean was just that Billy Batson's inside of a humongous guy's body. Right. Like the, the very first, the first movie, like he pulled it off where it's just like, whoa. And I, and I, and I, I'm, I literally. And you're talking about the rock. Basically he's supposed to be a child. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The rock, right. the child, like, I, like he did such a good job of acting. I was like, like, and then think, look at you. We're both scrawny compared to him. Like what, <laughs> I mean, what would it be like to be that huge? Like I can't even comprehend. Yeah. Thing that be so so I, I was given over to the fantasy of Jumanji more so than I was the Zachary Levi. Yeah. Uh, like I'm like that's the guy in a muscle suit. Like they should have got a guy that we aren't. Like we we physically would have to transform our bodies into these hulking masks to be this guy. And then The Rock obviously has charisma for days. So I felt like that was should have been their Captain Marvel yeah. um, character. I know they made him Black Adam, but. I felt like The Rock, like Maui was another, it's Maui rendition. It's just something about the charisma that it comes through uh, as for a big guy that you need. Anyway, that, well, like, that's one more tangent, just because you made me think of it. Why is it that SpongeBob SquarePants has been 2D art animation forever, but whenever they make a movie, it's in it's in CGI? I, I don't understand why all his movies are in CGI. It doesn't I mean, make sense I, to me. I, well, I think it's a, that's a corporate thing. Uh, I think 
the if you think about it, it hasn't been a 2D feature film in a long, long time. Yeah, I suppose and so. So most of the animated stuff, yeah. Now that you see so you're not a kid, so you're you're out of the spotlight <laughs> that they're aiming at, so you don't give a I, shit. I watch <laughs> quite a few cartoons for an old person. <laughs> no, I'm, no, I'm saying, I'm saying you're like you it probably just dawned on you, like, wait a minute, there hasn't been any flat. 2D animated items since we were kids. Yeah, I maybe so. teenagers. <laughs> yeah, I remember seeing Lion King in theaters. And the only reason I remember is because I saw um, David Robinson from uh, the San Antonio Spurs at the time. Uh -huh. And he was so tall, he was like a whole human taller than the crowd. I look over, I'm like, holy shit, that's David Robinson. Yeah. I mean, I didn't get to meet him or nothing. And so, you know, the story goes nowhere. But um, yeah, we don't we don't watch 2D films uh, in the theaters anymore. True. But uh, 3D, I think, is considered the cinematic standard now. And that's that's probably the answer to your question. So yeah. there you go. I'm just more of a fan of the 2D art. Anyway, I'll be able to wrangle this back to where we were. Okay, so my main question here is, um, so from this time, you were you had spent all this time creating a comic that you actually were going to promote at the Comic-Con. And you quickly did a, a pivot, which is a good thing in business. Uh, you, you look where the market is, but you spent all this time doing it. And now you're drawing uh, the the portraits first of all how long did you spend on the comic just to get some backstory on on the amount of time you spent before you realized I, like oh i could do this other thing i think that comic was at least a year maybe a year or two in the making like it did wow. not it wasn't something that was fast i mean you know this is once again we we're working both of us were working jobs nine yeah. to fives and all that so it was it was strictly a hobby i'm not saying it took me two years but right you know i get a it, page it, or two it wasn't that and, that's what you did every yeah. day for two years yeah okay yeah. Well, I kind of actually, well, after, well, not, not the only thing, but yeah. Right. Um, so, but, uh, and he, he learned that a lesson acutely too. We, we laugh about it, like how brutal it is to sell an indie comic, yeah. uh, direct sales. Like it's the, the irony is this, it had 20 pages of art that I was selling for, I think five bucks, uh -huh. but now I can sell one page of art for 200 bucks. That's yeah. Yeah. It's, it's. It's voodoo economics, as they used to say in the eighties. Like yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't fight it. Just people don't see value in correlated art, mm -hmm. but, but a single piece pr presents as more valuable to them. Even though, from my end as a producer, it took me way longer to produce that book, yeah, than it did that single piece of art per se. Mm -hmm. But they see more value in the single piece, so. The, the market decides. So you go with what the market is. Mm -hmm. so, and this is even know. before where uh, attention spans got shorter. Uh, now yeah. it's just like, it's really quick to get very popular from posting a picture online. Uh, yes. Whereas back then you were just, it was people, you were going to a show, tabling, setting up, and people were coming to look at it and going, that's great. I'm going to buy that. Like it was, it was, right. the, it was the long game comparatively now, which how did you, so you're drawing, you said you're drawing uh, the comic book characters and stuff like that. Now, are you just kind of uh, living sort of dangerously here? Like, how are you no, able to draw no, the, no. the characters? So in the beginning, I definitely thought that myself too. Like, man, I wonder how long this is going to last. Yeah. But um, pretty much they kind of treat us like indie bands doing cover songs. Okay. It's a privilege. It's definitely not a right. If they give us the privilege to do unlicensed fan art but there also is no way to do licensed fan art anybody telling you they're doing licensed fan art is lying to you okay. there's only there's only like a handful of people that work for marvel that have licensed art but there's no such thing as licensed fan art yeah like that's Marvel's art you know what i mean like so there's mm -hmm. like fan art are, are already should let you know that it's not marvel like if marvel owns it then the artist that did it is, is able to sell Marvel's art. So J. Scott Campbell, Greg Horn, guys like that yeah, have, have a, a, a limited license, but they still can't just do whatever they want to do. They got to run it up the chain, get it approved, da 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 da, -da. Uh -huh. uh, Us, on the other hand, we don't have that, but they allow us to do unlicensed art. Now, I've often actually wanted, and still to this day, I would love to have a, I call it a path to citizenship, if they had, okay, you know, you're an indie artist, uh, give us, you know, some, think of some number, 5, 10K, you get a license for X amount of years. Yeah. Uh, like a, like one, a mechanical would, license. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. It would beat a lot of people out, uh, which would be great for, for the industry, in my opinion. And it also would, you know, uh, I think it would um, 
give it more of a seriousness. And that that's 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 probably my my biggest uh if I could get on a soapbox, my biggest uh disheartening thing about fan art, and I, and I know this is rich coming from a fan artist, is that I wish people would take it more seriously. Like so? I, I I feel like the quality level isn't where it should be. Okay. Um if you look at professional art and then you go to pinup art, like it just drops off a cliff as far as the quality level. And so it's nice that it gives a lot of people at uh, a lesser uh, art quality state a shot. But at the same time, uh, what's happened now is that there's no meritocracy. So a lot of mediocre art has kind of taken over the show floor space. Okay. Whereas all the great artists are like kind of huddled in artist alley. You'll, you'll never see them unless you're looking for them. Right. And I, I wish it was more of a meritocracy, like where the best artists get the best spots. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not the case. It's the people that can afford to pay for the booth. Oh, of course. Get the best spots. So yeah, the um, people running the cons still need to also make their, <laughs> their back end. <laughs> they do. And that's, that's also another reason why we're kind of protected because we pay for a lot of real estate as, as fan artists, uh, good, bad, and ugly. So it yeah. um, doesn't matter what the quality is as long as they're you're paying for it. So that, that's that's an advantage. And like I said, it's I know it's it's for true, but I'm also a fan of yeah. art. So it I, I love looking at great art. And when it just you get to looking and it kind of looks like white noise, you know, like because it's all the same, it's very samey. It's like I wish somebody was bringing something new to the table uh, for as many artists as we have, like, and I often make the statements for as many artists that we have, they're not very imaginative, mm -hmm. strangely enough. Like, I feel like, I feel like we deserve more imagination out of our creatives. Yeah. Have, have, you, have you ever been approached for, uh, the fact that you were drawing fan art, like, uh, in a bad way? I mean, <laughs> um, not, yeah, not in a bad way. I, I got a, a cease and desist for, um, Five Nights at Freddy's which is a kid's uh, video game. Okay. But um, other than that, I've actually gotten a lot of gigs from having fan art. So I've done oh. um, a lot of, so let's say you you own a toy license from Marvel. You know, you, you're not Marvel, but you got a license to do toys. You need a bunch of toys. It's like the plushies you got behind you. Right. Perfect yeah. example. Or like how uh, Kenner did the Star Wars toys and then it was uh, Amigo yeah. and all that yeah. kind of stuff. You're, yeah. you're, you're a rep for your company. You need artwork, style guides, turnarounds, mm -hmm. you know, uh, people like me once again. So I've done a lot of merchandise design for most of the major license holders, uh, mm -hmm. Hasbro, Disney, Nickelodeon, uh, you name it, Sanrio, like all of it. I've, I've had to draw Okay. Professional art. So it's not like I've just been on a, a rip and tear of just never doing any professional art. It's just I never wanted to do like um, basically where you, you're locked in uh, to a company. To, and so you got to do, you mm. know, okay. you know, eight pages uh, a month, which I, I don't know if anybody's even getting right. that done anymore. Yeah. And for not enough pay, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and uh so yeah, it, they, they and I've I've been approached by Marvel execs, DC execs, and they see my stuff, and some people even got some of my stuff on their in their offices. So nice. Yeah, I'm I'm not unknown. I'm I, I'm probably in the in the fan art industry. I'm probably like in the the top one percent of people that are that are known to do it. Well, like if you ask around, I'd be like, yeah, Terry Huddleston's like one of the one of the first guys to start doing yeah uh, pinup art in a major way. Well, and the reason that I met you is because you were at the con or the Mighty Con here in town, and you were printing out your own prints. So yep. you and, and I mean, like high quality, large, glossy, uh, embossed yep. prints. Which I was just like, "What's going on here?" And you explained it to me. <laughs> when yeah. did you start? When did you start doing your own print on demand? Like so, for yourself? I, I don't, I don't print the embossed prints myself, oh, okay. but I do print off. Uh, everything under that i started doing it because so one of the things that's led to to um me it's once again it's the only child syndrome uh -huh. but the reason i'm able to innovate so quickly once again because i don't have to go through a committee but i always think in terms of what's the fastest way for me to get the thing i want i always i always call it cheating how can i cheat and because when you think when you allow your brain to think outside of the box or thinking almost in a mischievous way, you actually come up with really great ideas. Like, 
it'd be awesome if I didn't have to pay somebody to print. Right. Right. right? Like before like you said you I wanted just have... to do a comic book on Kablam, but the price structure was just a little too much. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And in, in, in this case, it was more or less I had drawn myself into a corner where I had so many images and having to bring a physical representation of those images to a show just got to be out of control. Yes. So, so one thing I did is I, um, I started doing metrics maybe, uh, four years ago and the numbers don't lie. The numbers tell you like, Hey, you only sell this much of this, Mm -hmm. this of this. And so once you aggregate, like, okay, I sell, you know, uh, 351 copies of any given thing. I only need, if I, what if I could cheat and only bring that many blank sheets of paper and turn it into the thing I needed to be like, that would reduce my inventory astronomically. And I had that thought for years, but then it, it, I finally got brave enough to just start it printing on demand. And it's, it's been a life changer. Wow. Um, for me, like it's, it's given me a growth opportunity. Uh, and it's also allowed me to take all my archive work over the past, uh, 14 years is still available, Uh but I don't have to have it physically with me, uh, at all times. So if you ask for some of my, you know, older art i could be like yeah i got that give me five minutes boom here you go <laughs> well because you, you're saying you're doing it from the digital file that you create the digital file yep okay as long, long as the files don't how are you making the artwork are you doing it by hand and then scanning it in or are you doing it on no, the computer you're doing it digital, digital okay yep. uh tablet yep. or like wacom or like so yeah i use i use a wacom intuo so i i, I was able to break my hand eye coordination uh-huh. and so i can look at a screen Okay. A, a, a monitor while I draw. I don't have to look at what I'm drawing okay. on. Like look, I don't have to look down and draw uh, anymore. So that's that's kind of nice. That is one uh, of the but, things people tell me they have a hard time with. Like I I've gotten used to it. I have an old bamboo here that I've had. I still had yep. for years, and I'm using that. Yeah. So I know that, that's doing. actually what I had before I had the Intuos. And it, okay. It it wasn't something I actively meant to do. It's just something that happened from using a tablet for so many years. Yeah. You get used to looking up, but you also get I feel like it's more comfortable. Mm-hmm. And so I'm able to draw longer without fatigue, you know, the neck fatigue and all that stuff, back pain. Yeah. Um, that, that comes with, you know, having a bolder size head. That's, <laughs> so, I know, you know I, I have a big old Irish head over here too. So you I know go. what you mean. <laughs> you know? But um, so yeah, I um, do it all digital. And, and at that point um, at 28, uh, when I was 28, I'm 43 now, I, decided to go completely digital. Uh, and that was another uh, one of those, once again, unilateral, like, you know what, I'm going to cut out paper because, you know, you lose a little bit of data when you scan stuff. Yeah. Um, and so I learned to draw digital only. And I did take a skill dip, but like I said, nobody cared about me back then anyway. So, <laughs> you, you, know, you were able to from, expand. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's something about being mediocre that, that has a certain freedom to it. Because, you know, you're not on anybody's radar when you're mediocre. It's true. So that's the time to retool. It's like a, it's like a bad football team. Like, that's <laughs> the time to try new shit. Like, nobody yeah. cares about Like, you got the fans you got already. And you're not going to get any new fans unless you do try something different. So right. now that's, that's the time to really rock and roll. And I, I actually kind of lament those early days because I was able to, you know, really try a lot of stuff and see what sticks and – Today, like people expect a certain type of thing, and uh, I'm still able to make moves. Don't get me wrong, but uh, you know, the, the, there's you know, you become like the Rolling Stones, where they want you to sing your hits, right? You know, they they don't they don't they don't they don't want a rap album out of Rolling Stones. They're not gonna pack a stadium <laughs> and then hit them with some new tracks they came up with. Like they're like, that's not what we want. Like uh-huh. sing Freebird, you right. know, it's not Freebird. You know what I mean? But yeah, um, let us get it. But um, yeah, so. There's that, but uh, it's it's been a um a, a, a great uh, career, and I definitely, like I said, I wouldn't change anything uh, for the world. I've, I've learned so much. It's one of those industries. I, I feel like this is with any micro business mm-hmm. where I, I feel like I got paid a lot of money to learn things mm. and do what I like. It's it's like a weird synergy to where I got to draw every day and get paid to educate myself on how to run a micro business. Yeah. And I, I think I coined the term micro business. I haven't heard anybody else use it, but uh, once I, I think I've heard how, it, but I'll give it to you for this. Okay. Yeah, no, hey, hey, that's why, that's why I don't want to be like, all right, I don't want to be like Trump. Like, I made it, dad, it's my word, wrong. But uh, listen, so 
Uh, and the reason I, I coined the term, or at least think I did, is because small businesses, like every people are like, oh, we own a small business. Like, no, you don't. <laughs> like, small Man. businesses make hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. <laughs> Like, you're so far away from a small business. Like, we kind of put ourselves, like, they're doing tax breaks for small businesses. Like, that doesn't mean you. Right. Like, you know what I mean? Like, we people are like, but, so I actually, for political reasons, I actually think we should have a micro business designation so people like yourself can get stimulus money uh-huh. and, and, and pretty much get the corporate welfare for the regular one-off guy because we're not going to hire 100 people, but- no. Like if you put money in our hands, you're gonna run out and buy more film equipment mm-hmm. and stuff you need, and probably some toys too. But you know, <laughs> I'll probably buy toys. You know, but but it's it's for work purposes. But uh, and same thing. But but realistically, like with now that these um stimulus checks are coming have been coming out for the past couple of years, people like you and me, I invested it in the business. Oh yeah. And people that didn't invest it in the business invested it in us. I and my internet sells skyrocketed over 2020 yeah. i never had any good online sales whatsoever and so i actually was just leading up to asking you about your online sales so i'm glad that you brought it up so yeah, yeah. there you go yeah <laughs> my, the 2020 basically put me on the map um i i did some things to my website right as the pandemic caused the first shutdown or the beginning of the shutdown and um got my site together because I had had it for a couple of years, but it was really terrible. As mm-hmm. a matter of fact, a customer had sent me an angry email saying, why is your website so terrible? <laughs> and um, I, nice. I, I I just shot, I don't know. And what's funny is I, I was doing well enough out in Comic Con world that I could, I could be a bad dad to my website. Like I was ignoring it and yeah, not, um, it is one of those things where it's like, what do you spend the time on? Do you spend it on, uh, stuff that's currently making you money and then you can blow off the stuff where it's like, well, that will probably do well, but I don't need to do it right now. And yeah. Right. And then it gets farther and farther away. I know the feeling. Yeah, no, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is boring. It's boring as sin. Mm-hmm. So like you, you're bored. You're like, Oh, I gotta, okay. Move this. But I finally did all that. And then literally the next day, like things are happening. I'm like, Whoa, that's, mm-hmm. that's the universe. Answer my call. Like right away. Like that was probably one of the fastest turnarounds of, a call to action and then a response mm-hmm. to that action. And so it gives you that, that uh, Pavlovian effect of like, what else could I change? That's going to also change immediately. And so you, you start getting into this mode of, you know, change, change, change. And uh, it's, it's, it's been, it's been fun, but yeah. So yeah, web online sales are good. Um, you know, no, I'm not making like an insane amount of money. I couldn't live off of it. Yeah. But it's definitely it's a market that isn't it's there. Nice. Yeah, it's oh, the, yeah. you have the ability like you can make a sale at like midnight and you didn't have to go anywhere, you know. <laughs> no. Oh yeah, for sure. That that happens all the time. Yeah. Speaking of Pavlovian effect, uh every time I do get a sale, I get this wonderful chime that just it's uh and I just get this dopamine like, yes. And it, and it it's so random and unexpected when it can happen. It could be two in the morning. Yeah, it can yeah, happen right now, and it, it's such a great uh, uh, sound effect that they, they they just it's tuned right into the the monkey brain part of my 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 uh, psychology. Where I'm just like, yeah. oh, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> you know, so yeah, for sure. Oh man, and if people wanted to check out your stuff and the store that you're talking about, where would you suggest people go to do that? Well, I got it all simplified thanks to my wife. It's Terry Huddleston Art. Dot com and you sh- yeah, send well, everything there. Yep, Terry Hosted Art gets you anything you need to know about me. If you just pop that in Google, Facebook, mm-hmm. Instagram, uh, website. Before yeah. that, I had all these frou frou names and kind of <laughs> trying to sound pretentious and hero art or I kind of. And my wife was like, "Just make it your name, idiot." And I'm like, "Yeah, I, I guess you're right. I'll just do Terry Hosted Art." And ever since then. Branding wise, everything's clicked. You know, I made myself into a logo. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, I think I got uh, a copy of one of my bags right here. Oh, nice. There you go. So, you know, so always brand yourself if you can, because, you know, you, as long as you're around, you, you're your greatest mascot. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any uh, events or like projects or anything coming up that you'd like to tell people about? Um. So uh, as far as projects, uh, me and my wife are working on a project together called affinity and that's right on like the first thing you should see on my website is 
the Affinity Series. It's a series of kind of uh, esoteric uh, fantasy art uh, oh. based on the tarot. Um, and then uh, uh, as far as immediate events, we've got C2E2 coming up this weekend. And then uh, I think Con Out Delete coming up after that. And then a couple weeks off for us to celebrate Christmas and New Year's. Then it's right back at it. Well, I want to thank you so much for uh, meeting with me to talk today. It was great. It was great meeting up with you again. No problem, man. I'm, I'm, thanks for having me. 